Hi, I'm Rosemary Sanchez Fraser, and uh, I'm, uh, well, I was raised in Boyle Heights, and I lived um, in uh, S Los Angeles and uh, worked at Kaiser Permanente for almost 40 years. I've lived in Santa Clarita for almost 40 years, and uh, I'm retired since uh, 2009, and since then I've been trying to help my community, and uh, I was a delegate for the Democratic Party the past two years, and I've uh, started a Democratic club in the community that I live in. I'm a docent at the Placerita Nature Center, and I'm a, a bereavement minister at my church. And uh, that's enough for now, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, my name is uh, Jim Solis. Um, I was born in uh, Texas, San Antonio, and uh, came out here as a young boy looking for a job. <laughs> um, Texas unemployment can be brutal. And uh, wound up in East Los Angeles, not very far from, <laughs> not very far from Rosemary on, uh, in East LA. And uh, wound up staying here uh, all these years. Um, well, yeah, I'm a member of uh, the, I think the uh, DAA and some other groups, but that, you know, it's not really that to me, I mean, what I'm a member of is less significant than what I believe, so it's more important. I also go to a church, you know, I belong to a church, and that's important too, but. Well, uh, gosh, it actually goes back to uh, several years. Um, I retired in 2000, and it uh, took me a couple years to uh, adjust to that. I know Rosemary can well appreciate my, you know, the adjustment period. And then I started looking around uh, what was happening in the community. Um, I'd seen what uh, you know, the city council was, was about, hard not to. I also took a peek and took a look and see what was going on in the community college. At the time, I was interested in taking some classes. You know, you're retired, want to do something with your life or more. And then I started looking at the community college system itself and uh, was very surprised, very surprised. Um, by 2005, uh, there was this, a situation developed in the community. Two brothers, uh, Mexican-American young men, had uh, a grocery store here in the community. It's called Tres Sierras. They had wanted to expand because their business was really growing fast, I mean, really quick. Used to go in there and it was just, you know, you'd have to move around cramped. They found a place down the block that was being built by a, a real estate outfit, and nice and big, 2,800 square feet as opposed to their 7,000, as I recall. Had some little shops nearby, very nice. Nice and large, you could expand, you had a lot of room. Uh, they made an offer, the deal seemed to go through. In fact, uh, then Mayor Smythe, and city council member Westy showed up, gave it the approval. It looked, had their pictures taken. Everything was going smoothly. And then everything was going smoothly. <laughs> and it rolled on and on. And the next thing you know, another company, not a, not a small outfit, you know, local outfit, not a couple of local guys, but a large corporation with Lots of markets all over the place in three or four counties. Moves in and before you know it, bam, they moved in. With Namby arguments and all, they still moved in. Which 
all the while, you know, the Tres Sierra brothers were busy trying to get it together with the city council and this other large corporation moves in. This is the Vallarta market. Uh, both, both markets competing, you know, in some ways for the same, same public, but at the same time, the speed and dexterity with which a large corporate outfit moves in, all the while a local small business outfit is struggling to make a foothold in the community and to serve the community, all that time, bam, lost. Ultimately, the brothers rele released a statement and said, well, you know, um, demo something to the effect that demographics were changing and they were going to forget about it. And the place remained open, as we both know, for a couple of years, two, three years. I think they only recently occupied it. And uh, in the wake of that, something else started to happen. The issue of immigration started to really percolate. And I don't know of any intelligent, sensible Latino, Mexicano who wasn't watching that issue and watching the fury around it. And of course the fury reached here in Santa Clarita. You know, this is, this town was named El Pueblo de Santa Clarita, which is a saint. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And uh, the mayor began, the mayor and the city council began to make noise about it illegal immigration. Uh, only they had less, uh, less, uh, how should I say, less intelligent language to use, verbiage, to describe uh, immigration. And they targeted the Mexicano population and the Latino population. Um, and of course then came the famous uh, rally, and I was there. In fact, I was at one point almost right next to the mayor, but I walked across the street, and I was there, and I watched it, and I listened to it. This would have been 2010-11, uh, and at that point, um, uh, I realized that it wasn't just about undocumented people, human beings. There was something else happening. All this time, you know, since the California Voters' Rights Act had been initiated, neither the city nor the community college had made any effort to reach out to the community and to try to integrate that board. In other words, to desegregate the board. I mean, this is 2013, you know, 2011, 13. So it, it, something was wrong in, in my mind. Something didn't, it didn't quite jive. And what didn't jive was that the boards always remain the two principal boards of the two key institutions of this community remained um, Anglo. Now it's true that there have been uh, one or two candidates have shown up, and, and but even they didn't make it. I mean, it was just, and I'm like, you know, Mike Cruz, of course, you know, he didn't make it, didn't even come close. And that did not make any sense at all. And that's when I began to realize that what I hadn't realized all along, what I just really was beginning to really uh, understand, that the whole issue of civil rights had always been focused on the sound and the ways in, for example, in Texas, how it was sabotaged. The 1965 Civil Rights Act was sabotaged in different ways. Poll taxes now, uh, picture IDs today, long lines tomorrow and closed, you know, on, on, on the days that folks have time and want to go vote. But that didn't see, that wasn't happening in California because in California, I always thought, well, we're a very progressive state. What's happening here? Why, why, aren't, we, why aren't we going somewhere with it? 
you know, why aren't we really uh, in the 21st century? And uh, it was beginning to dawn on me that something was wrong with how we were voting. And that was the reason why we had a Voters' Rights Act here in California. The purpose of that act was to correct the deficits, you know, the, the circuitous deficits, the circuitous ways of getting around civil rights, of undermining it. And all this time, I'd been looking for, vo you know, somebody to, to say, hey, wait a minute now, it's, that's not legal, that ain't, that's not right. Wait, 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 just a minute, please. But of course, you know, the first thing that I always ran into is, well, have you got any money? <laughs> Do, you know, you know, how much money have you got? You know, this is expensive. Civil rights is not cheap. You know, uh, uh, voters' rights, which is civil rights, is not cheap. And then, of course, I heard about and read about the challenge in Palmdale, you know, and, and, and Kevin's work there and his team, and uh, I said to myself, holy cow, this is, this is what I've been looking for. That's right. This is, this is what it's about. We've got to challenge it, and we have to challenge it legally, and he's doing, doing it the right way. And I started looking around to see who, who knows this guy. <laughs> I, who, who knows him? I don't know him. You know, never heard of him. And they said, no, it's some guy from Malibu. I said, who? From where? Malibu. <laughs> Malibu, but you know, you 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 when a when you're drowning, you know, and you're reaching for a hand, you don't really care what color the hand is or whether it's greasy or not or whatever. You just you reach and you grab. You reach and you grab, and that's. That's how we ran into each other, you know. And that's what was important. Um, and of course, you know, I knew I wasn't the only one. I mean, you know, Rosemary, other people are involved in this as well, have been involved for some time. So it's not as if uh, all of this was just out of the blue. I think it's new to Santa Clarita largely because we don't have uh, a viable uh, media network that will, you know, um, put these issues out of there. But I noticed that recently it's begun to. Uh, I noticed that your station has begun to do that. Other outlets are beginning to do that, and that's wonderful. We need more of that. As I as I told you, I've got I wear a lot of hats, and one another one of the hats that I wear is I'm the vice president of uh, Santa Clarita Valley Democratic Club. I got involved with that because I had um, wanted I had become an activist and uh, become uh, a delegate, and I was looking to see where I could fit in and. Um, the, the Democratic Club, Santa Clarita Valley Democratic Club, uh, is a small club, yet it's uh, very much into education of um, uh, the people here. Uh, so it, it, fi it filled a little niche that I, that I needed. And um, as I work in getting people educated, uh, this came up. And I thought, you know, it's true. We don't have any representation uh, for the Latino Mexicanos in our city. And uh, they're all over the place. We're, we're very uh, visible but invisible. You see us everywhere. You see us um, providing services everywhere in the, in the restaurants. Uh, car washes, gardeners, but where are their voices? They have no voice. And um, I just thought this was a good start to, to um, get people educated in 
that we need to have some more representation for us. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, why not the heart board? That's the question. We only well, have of so course. Many I'm sorry? We only have so many people. Right? <laughs> There's so many at a time. So many at a time. That's true. And, and of course, there is a representative there. Uh, that's another thing. Uh -huh, uh, I think that's the, the, the key issue for now. But uh, I, I hope that you understand that because you have one uh, I'm sorry uh, because you have one uh, Latino Mexicano on uh, the city council or on the community college just because you have one that doesn't mean anything that's not integration that that's not desegregation that comes when you have the colores, everybody. And hopefully they're young. Hopefully they're young with some vitality and some new ideas. That's an integrated board, a governance board. Now, of course, you know, Hart has uh, a representative. So the real issue that should be asked is, why aren't there more? Why? Aren't there more? Why hasn't the board taken it upon itself to promote governance as a reality for the excluded? That's a real issue. That's a principal issue. And so we, I personally felt that, all right, well, let's give them a shot. Maybe they don't understand just yet that just because you got one doesn't mean you've settled, you've settled the issues here, uh, quite the contrary, that's the beginning. That's just the beginning, you know, so, so that Filipino Americans can be there and Africa, African Americans can be there, so, you know. <sighs> Statistics. Uh, our statistics, and uh, all of us know that what you put in to statistics is what you're going to get out. Um, I learned that a long time ago. Um, I'm obviously n no one in his right mind is not going to be happy with good data. But again, good data is good data. But is it? Is that good data really reflect all of the populations involved in that district? I don't know. All I know is that data has been presented. How should that data be further analyzed? I don't know. What about the community college system? Uh, <laughs> coincidentally, today they're having a Hispanic College Day, uh, you know, at College Advancement Day. And for me, Articulation, that's what it's called in the business of com the community college. Articulation is the, the issue. That is the issue. So it's good that they're having a fair, a Hispanic fair today. <coughs> but that's, what about the other 364 days? What about those? What, what do children do? What do young people do? What do young Latinos, Mexicanos do? One of the questions I keep hearing, for example, is how come they don't stay in school? Why don't they stay, you know, they're always walking out. What's your curriculum all about? How come you people aren't more interested in the community? Not interested in the city, not interested in our history of our community? What history? Is there an African-American history 
studies program in COC? Is there a Latino Mexicano program? <laughs> is, there a, is there a class on Santa Clarita and the contributions of the Mexicanos who were here, let alone the nativos, not just the Tatavillam, but all the rest? What, 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 300 and one day? You're gonna, well, I'm glad that there is one day. I'm glad that's there. You know, that's, that's good. But that's a beginning. And with an integrated board, a desegregated board, you wouldn't have just a beginning once a year. And if you did, well, that's the idea of getting Latinos to vote. I'm sure that as they have in East LA <laughs> and in San Antonio and elsewhere, they'll take care of business too with folks who do and don't, don't represent the community's interest. That's democracy. What, I just wanted to let you know, one thing I discovered as a docent at the Placerita Nature Center is um, the, uh, the, the footprint that we did, the Latinos did, in um, the early days when there was a gold rush here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like to teach the kids when I, when I have a chance that um, back when there was a gold rush here, everybody was running and digging up the gold and, and uh, they would have um, a festival every year uh, where they would all come in their horses and, and the women would wear all the gold that they, uh, I guess their husbands or uh, family had dug out and made into jewelry for them. And none of that is, none of that is taught except I dug it up somewhere and I, uh, I try to pass it on, but I never would have known that if I hadn't have researched it myself. And they, they played a really important part here um, in the ranchos and, uh, and uh, the, yeah, in keeping the, the customs going on. So I just. And today that's almost. Uh, you, don't, you don't yeah, hear, about hear about it. Hear about cowboys? Gotta have yeah. cowboys, we're gonna have cowboys. But what about the real cowboy? Not the real cowboy, but what about the cowboys who were here first? Mining and farming. Nobody ever hears about Fremont, for example. General Fremont, how he used to go up and down the valley chasing Mexicans away from the, you know, uh, agitating the uh, local Anglo farmers to kick out the Mexicans, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody hears about that, but that's maybe why we, we need more people on the board. <laughs> right. Get right. a better, better education going here, at least a more historical one. We just want representation. It's, there's been injustice uh, here for so long. And uh, now the, it's, been, it's against the law. And now the law is there for us to work with and we need representation. And there's more Latinos, Mexicanos here than there have been for a long time. And uh, they need representation. We need it. I think uh, on the, the business, well, you know, they're only bilking. <laughs> They're bilking the school systems. Our poor children are going to be out there, you know, without supper. <laughs> uh, oh, my goodness. Well, you know, the, first of all, can you really put a price? Can you really put a price tag? on honesty can you really can you can you that's the question can you really put a, a price on honesty what's the price of honesty what's the price more importantly now what's the price of equality and if you haven't been doing it all those years then isn't it time 
that you started thinking about the consequences of what you've done and what it's going to cost to correct it. Now, in actuality, future costs would be future costs. I mean, no matter what elections are going to be held in the future, they're going to be held. But you know, that's kind of a devious question. In fact, it's really a dishonest one. And that's why I say, let's be honest. This isn't really about what they're going to, you know, the, what the fines or whatever money, all that. This isn't about money. Money has nothing to do with it. What this is about is desegregating a community, of bringing a community into the 21st century, and if necessary, of rebirthing the civil rights movement. And if it's going to be reborn, let it be, be, be reborn here. Why not here? Why not here? I, in actuality, it's already being reborn up and down the valley. I just heard from some folks in Santa Barbara, you know, it's happening here. You know, we're doing it also. So equality is being reborn. And is there going to be a price to it? I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is how soon these boards will sit down with us. Instead of them spending the money, them spending the money, that's, that's right. They're spending the community's money needlessly, wasting it on trying to, to defeat desegregation on trying to defeat equality, equity. That's coming out of your pocket. So Kevin, forget about Kevin. That's not the issue. That's not the issue. And by the way, have any of these folks uh, in the community college system or uh, in the city council, have they asked, should we do this? Have they asked the community, hey, should we go out and spend all this money, whatever it is, I don't know. Should we spend any money on fighting desegregation? Have they asked that of the community? If they have, geez, I don't, I, I haven't heard it. It's, it's, all I hear is a lot of wind. I would like to see um, good representation from every, for all of Santa Clarita. Uh, we want representation from, uh, for Saugus, for Newhall, for Canyon Country, for, I, I want the representatives to go into their communities. Um, I know we have Latinos in every community, but I want them I want them to hear the voices of the Latinos. What, what do they need? They need streets, sidewalks, they need lighting, they need uh, a lot of things that, that we don't have in all of, all of the areas like they do in Valencia. Why is, now I know, okay, Valencia pays high taxes. Well, hi, I pay taxes too, I pay lots of taxes. And uh, I still don't, have uh, sidewalks, um, you know, we need, when, when, when Santa Clarita became a city, I guess we all thought we were going to get better representation than being just part of Los Angeles. Well, it hasn't happened. And so now if we have district voting, um, we have a better chance of having representation in all the corners of Santa Clarita. When you have a highly centralized system, everything takes place around that system. Years ago, in the community college movement, they had a concept called the cluster college. And the cluster college concept was basically that you took a big college and you, de you disorganized the big college and you sent out your faculty and students into the community. 
and the cluster college would take place in the community, not in a large, huge building, but in the community, in small places in the community, cluster colleges. It meant decentralizing the universities. Well, um, it turned out it, it was a good idea, but other things happened, namely budgets and disinterest, particularly political disinterest, and the politics of the times just swept it under. Districts, district voting is nothing more than just that. So, as I understand district voting, it means decentralizing the voting into smaller districts. Instead of all of us voting for a list in which none of us really get what we need out of it, we vote in a smaller community. I understand that back east, some of the smaller states have this concept where people meet and they discuss and they break down and there's caucuses and there's a lot of discussions, very, you know, very forthright, very aggressive. I think, I forget the states it's in, very small states. I think Vermont is one of them. But it works, and it works brilliant and beautifully, and everybody's happy and everybody gets to say so, and then you vote and then you go home and it's over with. <laughs> Gee, that sounds a lot like what happens today, except that you get to meet your neighbor and you get to know what's, what's up and what you think and what you don't. And if you're a candidate, they know you, you know them. Of course, there's going to be pluses and minuses, pluses and minuses to everything. But we've got to be bold and we've got to be forthright and we've got to desegregate, period. Uh, this issue has brought up a lot of um, anger from certain folks uh, and <laughs> maybe they just don't understand what it is not to be able to have a voice um, and for instance uh, I was thinking at one point in my life I, I didn't vote and it was because I was so busy making a life going to work, um, paying my bills, trying to stay up with um, my rent and everything else, my, my grocery bills, uh, everything. And this is what a lot of people are doing. I didn't have um, a lot of the problems that many of the people here have. Uh, a lot of the Latinos that, that have to work two jobs or three jobs, the mother and the father, they're all working hard and uh, trying to make a better life for their children. And uh, unfortunately, with that, the children don't have proper um, care. It's unfortunate. And um, a lot of them do, but a lot of them don't. So. I, I think we need to make sure all of our children have proper care, have proper education, and uh, food, you know. Uh, it's here, too, in this community. Kids are going around hungry, not being able to have a proper meal, and uh, it's, it's sad. We have to start here in our own backyard. 